The focus of this next lecture is epigenetics. Basically what we're studying is how different environmental factors, chemicals, stress, exercise, how can that affect gene expression? So we're looking at things that can alter the structure of DNA other than mutations. Remember, mutations are a change in the base sequence. But we know that at different times of your life, certain genes are turned on and turned off. And the structure of DNA is altered during those times. DNA can go from heterochromatin to euchromatin, and now genes that were once silenced are now being expressed. So we're trying to learn what are the different factors that allow these different genes to be expressed and silenced. Epigenetics is a fairly new field of genetics. We have a lot to learn. So here's some things that we know. We know that all cells in a single organism has the same set of genes, yet these genes are going to be expressed differently. Now this diagram should look familiar to you. We talked about how genes in a neuron and skin cell from the same person are the same, yet some are expressed and some are silenced causing the differences in these cell types. We know that gene expression can change as you age. So genes that were silenced earlier might be expressed later on in life. An example of that is with type 2 diabetes. This is a disease that develops later on in life. So we're trying to learn why did the expression of these genes change? What was it about what this person was exposed to, their environment, different chemicals, stress, exercise? Why did that cause the expression of these genes or the silencing of genes giving them type 2 diabetes? Can we reverse that? Another example is lactose intolerant. Whenever you're young, you express the genes that code for lactase, and they can break down lactose, milk sugar, so milk doesn't upset your stomach. But as you age, those genes are altered. And so 40% of us are going to become lactose intolerant in our 30s and 40s. So just to give you an idea of some of the research that we're doing, we're trying to learn why do different cells express genes differently. So why does a neuron express certain genes differently from a skin cell? Epigenetics also relates to stem cells because we would love to be able to take a stem cell and coax it through cell signaling to express different genes and differentiate into different types of cells that we could use to replace tissue or build an organ for someone. We would love to know how we can turn off or silence genes related to disease. So again, reversing type 2 diabetes in someone that didn't have diabetes whenever they were younger. And also, how can we alter the genes related to cancer cells? Turning off or turning on specific genes, which could maybe cure cancer in an individual. But those are examples of just a few questions that are being researched through epigenetics. Now I want to review a concept that we've talked about in every single unit, cell signaling. Gene expression can be affected by cell signaling. We know that genes are expressed or silenced due to signals received by the cells. Now we built models. Remember we showed ligands binding the receptor proteins and that activates other proteins in the cytoplasm. And ultimately it's going to change gene expression. And you can see that in this diagram here. We can have reception of a signal we have transduction of a signal in the cytoplasm, and ultimately you can see that the DNA is be being affected somehow. Now, all we really focused on is that signals can be molecules, and we showed proteins binding to receptor proteins, or lipid hormones crossing the membrane binding to receptors in the cytoplasm, but we haven't talked about other things that can cause changes in gene expression. There's environmental factors that can alter gene expression. The amount of light, the temperature, the amount of water, even gravity, can affect gene expression of cells. So let me give you an example of how the environment can cause changes in gene expression, and then changes to a phenotype of an organism. So think of rabbits that live in cold environments. In the spring, everything unthaws, and the rabbits are brown in color. But in the winter, whenever it snows and everything's white, their coat color changes. It changes to white. Now this isn't because the rabbit wills it, but the rabbit decides it's time to change its coat color to white so it can blend in with the snow, there's environmental cues that alter gene expression in those cells that produce those hairs. So let me ask you, what do you think that is that is going to affect the coat color of rabbits? Is it light, temperature, water? Now if you looked at these diagrams, it's given the answer away to you. It's actually the amount of light. In a day, that is affecting their coat color. 
Same with the flowering of plants. Plants won't flower until we get so much daylight hours in a day. Same with the dropping of leaves. That's triggered by the fact that our days are getting shorter and our nights are getting longer. Now, I would say a lot of students filled in that blank with temperature. But think about how temperature would not work very well for signaling coat color change or the flowering of plants. We can have 70 degree days sometimes in January. So imagine if it was temperature cueing a change in gene expression, then by February, these rabbits would be brown in color, even though it could be snowing for the next four months. If a warm day caused plants to start to flower, then that could happen in January. They'd be flowering by February, and we could have several frosts before spring and summertime, which would actually kill that tissue and harm the plant. So temperature is not a good env environmental factor to activate these changes in phenotype. So I included this diagram in here so you understand that molecules aren't the only signalers. Even light can be a signaler. And we can have receptors that can be altered by the amount of light. And that can affect gene expression. This is another example where gene expression is changed in cells. So if a plant detects that there's more sunlight coming from this direction, you've probably noticed that plants will bend towards the light. And the reason why this happens is because there's difference in gene expression in these cells that are on the dark side of the stem. So different genes are going to be altered so that this part right here of the stem can grow faster than the part that's receiving the sun. And that would allow that stem or that plant to bend towards the light. This is a good time to review a concept that I see often on the AP exam lipid versus protein signaling molecules, or ligands. Remember, hormone signalers that are lipid-based, fat-based, they can cross through the membrane. Now, when they cross through the membrane, they're going to be received by a cytoplasmic receptor. In the diagram that I just showed you with light, there was a cytoplasmic receptor that was being affected by light. So receptors just aren't proteins that are embedded in that plasma membrane. So once that cytoplasmic receptor receives that signal, binds that lipid hormone, then it's going to activate signal transduction pathways. Hormones that are protein-based, they have to bind to receptor protein in the membrane. Remember, proteins are too big to cross through that sun membrane. They also have hydrophilic regions because of those hydrophilic side chains. They cannot cross through those nonpolar tails. And when they bind to those receptor proteins in that plasma membrane, then they're going to activate secondary messengers in the cytoplasm. The secondary messengers are going to then take care of the cell signaling in the cytoplasm. You should be able to look at these diagrams. And if I take away these labels, like this one and this one, you should be able to determine that uh, that is a lipid-based hormone and that, or that is a protein-based hormone. We can tell that this signaling molecule is likely a protein, whereas we should be able to tell that this one is a lipid because it's crossing right through that cell membrane, binding to this receptor that's in the cytoplasm. Now, if you understand protein synthesis, transcription, and translation, then this is going to be a piece of cake for you because what we're going to focus on is where in that central dogma or that flow of information, where in transcription, translation, can we alter things in the cell to stop the expression or the production of a protein? Or what can happen to these different molecules and these different factors to promote the expression of a protein? So all these processes that relate to gene expression, I'm going to go through, but I've summarized them here on this part of the page. Now, each of these processes can be categorized into one of five different categories. The first thing we're going to look at is what can happen to DNA which would affect gene expression. So these are called DNA structure controls. Then we're going to look at what are some things that would stop transcription or promote transcription. So these are called transcriptional control mechanisms. Now, even after the mRNA is made, there's some things that we can do to the mRNA, and that would affect the making of a protein. So these different processes are called post 
transcriptional controls because post means after. So it's after transcription, the mRNA is made, what can we do to the mRNA? There's also translational controls. So what can we do to stop translation or ensure translation is going to take place? And then finally, if we're talking about post-translational controls, this means after translation. So that means that the polypeptide has been assembled. What can happen to that polypeptide, which would maybe lead to the destruction of that protein? So when we're done with this lecture, you should be able to look at this diagram right here. And you should be able to tell me several ways that we can alter whether a protein is going to be made by the cell. What can we do to the DNA? What can we do during transcription? What can we do to mRNA? What can we do during translation? And what can we do to that final protein that's made? And like I said, if you have a good understanding of the steps of protein synthesis, then this is going to be a piece of cake. Now before we jump into those five different levels of gene control, I want to emphasize that what we're talking about is we're talking about gene regulation in eukaryotic cells. How it is that organisms that are eukaryotic can turn on and turn off certain genes. When we get to bacteria, prokaryotic cells, it's a whole different ballgame. So these are genetic controls related to eukaryotic cells only. So the first thing we're going to look at is DNA structure controls. So the structure of DNA can change other than through mutations. Chemicals combine to DNA and can affect whether it's going to be transcribed or not. Now, these different chemicals that can affect the structure of DNA, they're referred to as the epigenome. Now, genome refers to basically DNA and the genes that are on your DNA. Epigenome, epi means kind of on the outside. So these are the things that can affect your genome, that can affect your DNA. So let's take a look at this diagram and these molecules right here because these are the molecules that we're going to focus on. These molecules are methyl groups. And we know that the methyl groups can change on the DNA molecule. So DNA itself, so you can see right here there is methyl group bound straight to the DNA. But we can also see these proteins here that the DNA is organized around, those histones. And we can see that methyl groups can attach to histones. So DNA and histones can become methylated or unmethylated, and it's going to affect transcription. If the DNA is methylated or the histones are methylated, it leads to tight coiling of the DNA, forming a term that we already talked about, heterochromatin. This is going to prohibit transcription on those genes that are tightly coiled. So here we have heterochromatin. So I like to think of these methyl groups as pins that will hold DNA tightly coiled together. Unmethylated DNA that we see up here is called euchromatin. Remember, U is Lu. U is loose. Loosely coiled DNA, euchromatin, can be transcribed. So you can see that the machinery to transcribe these genes like the RNA polymerase and those transcription factors, they can get to the gene and they can transcribe it. Here we see the attachment of methyl groups, and then we can see as a result that DNA coils up. No transcription can occur to those genes. Those genes have been silenced. Now let's talk about bar bodies. They're related to methylated DNA. In females, remember, you have two X chromosomes, your XX. Well, you only are expressing the genes on one of the Xs in every single one of your cells. And it differs between cells. Sometimes the X that you got from your mom is not being expressed. Whereas sometimes that X that you got from dad in some of your cells is methylated and those genes aren't being expressed. But if you think about it, guys only have one X. So they are expressing the genes off of one X, and we do as well because one of our X's is inactivated. Okay? So an inactivated X forms this structure right here. It's called a bar body. So a bar body is just a methylated X chromosome. So again, here's this example where we are controlling gene expression by the methylation of DNA. 
Now I want to get into some findings in epigenetics that I find completely fascinating. And it's the fact that your DNA is methylated or unmethylated because of your diet, exercise, stress, toxins, what you're exposed through throughout your life. So again, let's relate this back to people who develop type 2 diabetes. Is they had genes related to diabetes, obviously, and they had those genes their whole life, but they were methylated. They were not being expressed. Whereas later on in life, because of your lifestyle, it can affect the methylation, and now those genes related to type 2 diabetes causing it are being expressed. Here's an interesting study. Is they took three-year-old twins and they were able to decipher the different areas of the DNA that was methylated and unmethylated. And you can see that it's color coded there. Whenever they were three years old, they showed the same methylation in the same areas on their DNA. But when they're 50 years old, they take a look at those same chromosomes again. And you can see that there's different epigenetic tags in different areas of their DNA because they had different lifestyles. They were exposed to different things. They had different diets. They maybe exercised a different amount. One was maybe more stressed than the other or exposed to more toxins as they grew. The methylation of your DNA can even be affected by how much care you're given by your parents. Now think about that. This is suggesting that if you cuddle more with your children, take care of them whenever they're sick, rock them whenever they need to be rocked, it is actually gonna affect the structure the methylation of their DNA and could affect which genes are expressed later on in their life. So let's talk about how cancer can relate to abnormalities in the epigenome. Remember, the epigenome is those chemicals that can affect the structure of DNA, like those methyl groups. In cancer cells, those genes that are coding for proteins causing the acceleration of cell division, those genes are unmethylated. They're expressing proteins related to cell division, even though that cell should not be dividing when it's dividing. Genes related to cell death and repairing of DNA and stopping those cells at different checkpoints in the cell cycle. Those genes are methylated. They're off. They're not functioning correctly. So that cell is able to divide out of control. So again, to summarize, the structure of DNA can be altered and that can affect gene expression. That can affect whether genes are going to be turned on or off in different cells. Next, we're going to look at different controls related to transcription. So what would stop transcription or what would promote transcription? One transcriptional control has to do with transcription factors. And we've talked about them earlier. So here we have transcription factors. So let's label them. I'm just going to put TF. And they bind to the TATA box. And whenever they're in place, then RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter and can transcribe a gene. Let's call this gene A. We know that during development, different cells get different transcription factors. So let's take a look at this diagram. So here we have a organism developing by mitosis. So cell division is occurring. Even gravity can affect which transcription factors get into different cells. So we can see here that we have these transcription factors. So I'm going to label them. Here's transcription factor. And let's say that's transcription factor E. And we have E right here. If E is not present, we know that gene A is going to be silent, so it's not going to be expressed. Now, let's take a look at as these cells continue to divide. Well, these cells down here got transcription factor E, but the cells above did not. So that means that gene A in these cells is never going to be activated. It's going to be silenced throughout the cell's life. So this is an example why nerve cells are not going to express genes related to melanin production. Melanin is a pigment that skin cells produce due to UV light. Now these cells down here, gene A, is going to be expressed throughout their life. Now moving right on, we're into that third type of control. The mRNA has been made. So we're into post-transcriptional controls or different things that would affect gene expression after the mRNA is made. The way that we can process mRNA can affect if the protein is actually going to pr be produced or which protein is going to be produced. The if the protein is going to be produced has to do with the length of the tails, those polyadding tails we add to the mRNA. 
different proteins can be produced from the same gene because of alternative splicing of the mRNA. So let's first look at how the length of the tail in the mRNA can affect gene expression or the making of a protein. One thing to understand is that the tails of, that are placed on the mRNA can be of different lengths. Now, as soon as the mRNA enters the cytoplasm, then nucleases, so those are enzymes that will degrade nucleic acids like mRNA, they will start to degrade the polyadenine tail. And you can see that happening right here. So we have Pac-Man here, that's a nuclease, and it's degrading the tail on our mRNA molecule that we see here. So let's label the mRNA. So if the mRNA, let's draw an mRNA here, let's draw it here, that's the coding region, and let's put a tail on it, let's make the tail look like this. Okay, remember it's adenines repeated over and over again. If the tail is long enough, then a ribosome is able to bind to the mRNA and is able to translate it. Let's label the ribosome. And we're going to get a protein. So in this situation, we're going to get a protein made. Some cells, whenever they make the mRNA off of this gene, so let's draw again, here's the mRNA, let's put a short tail on it. They have molecules that only result in a short tail. So this tail is going to get degraded even before that ribosome can bind to the mRNA and translate it. So no protein product is going to be made in this cell. So we say that the gene is silenced. Now one thing I want to point out is sometimes when we think of molecules degrading other molecules, like we have these nucleases that are degrading the mRNA, we have a tendency to think those nucleases must be bad. They are degrading a very important molecule in our cell. But this is a normal thing. After the mRNA is made, it must be destroyed. If it isn't destroyed, then ribosome after ribosome will attach onto it and will translate it and will keep making this protein even though the cell doesn't need the protein. And that would be wasteful, and our cells are definitely not wasteful. So the destruction of mRNAs as they reach the cytoplasm by those nucleases is a normal situation. Again, we're talking about post-transcriptional control. So we just talked about how tail link can affect gene expression. Now let's talk about that alternate splicing of mRNA. We've already talked about it, so this will be brief. Is we know that if we splice mRNA differently, then it can affect the protein that's made. So some cells, so let's say that cell A is going to splice their mRNA this way, and this is the protein they're going to get. Whereas cell B has different epigenetic factors that cause it to splice their mRNA this way and result in a different protein and so on. And here's another diagram showing you the exact same thing, alternative splicing of mRNA during mRNA processing. And again, it can affect the protein and gene expression. So finally, we're going to talk about these RNAi molecules that I've mentioned before. There's different types of RNA, messenger, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA, and we have RNAi molecules. This I stands for interference. And we're going to interfere with protein synthesis, basically stop it from occurring using these RNAi molecules. Now, there's two types of RNA molecules that you might come across. There's short interfering RNAs, and I'm going to put a line through it because I'm not going to teach you about those. But I'm going to teach you specifics about micro RNAs. You want to put micro there. So here's the deal is the curriculum guide says that I need you to be familiar with RNAi molecules. I do not have to teach you about a specific one. It's open as to which one I want to teach you about. So that tells me that if you have a problem on the AP exam about RNAi molecules, they're going to give you several paragraphs, and you're going to have to read about what RNAi does, either the short interfering RNA or the micro RNAs. If you have been taught at least one of them, then when you read through those paragraphs, you're going to be able to envision and figure out what's going on with these RNAi molecules. So we're just going to focus on one, the microRNAs. Now, microRNAs come from the junk DNA. That's what it was called whenever I was in high school. Or we can say the non-coding regions of DNA. So when I was a student, I was taught that only 2% 
of your DNA is genes that code for proteins, and 98% of your DNA is junk DNA, and it doesn't do anything. Well, we figured out that it does do something. It codes for these microRNAs. So just like a typical gene is split open by RNA polymerase, and we get transcription making messenger RNA, the same thing happens on these microRNA genes. So we get these microRNAs that are produced. These microRNAs will go and bind to the mRNA. So let's label the red as mRNA. And here is our microRNA. And it's going to bind to that mRNA. It can do two different things. One thing that it can do is it can target the mRNA to be degraded by enzymes before it's translated. Now, since we are altering mRNA, this is an example of a post-transcriptional control. Something else that can happen, and I'm going to show you this on a different diagram, is that when the microRNAs bind to the mRNA, it can block the ribosome. So the ribosome could be in the process of translating, and it runs into this microRNA, and it cannot proceed down the messenger RNA. So this is an example of a translational control. We're doing something to basically stop translation. Let's take a look at some more specifics about these microRNAs and how they're made. So it's not so confusing if you have to try to read about them for the first time on an AP exam. I just told you in general what they do, but there's some other things about them, and I don't want you to be thrown off if you have a problem and you're reading about microRNAs and you haven't heard of these things before. So again, the non-coding genes code for those microRNAs. Whenever the microRNA is made, so here we have the microRNA made, and this is, let's go ahead and put, this was the microRNA gene. This is what our microRNAs will look like. They fold up and they form the structure that we call a hairpin. Because it looks like a hairpin, it looks like a bobby pin. And I'm going to show you later on why they fold up like this. Now let's take a look at what happens to this hairpin microRNA. We see it exits the nucleus here, and we can see that something is happening to it from here to here, and obviously this molecule is doing that. So dicer is an enzyme, and it was named dicer because dicer dices. So that hairpin microRNA is cleaved, or it's diced by dicer. And now it's in segments like this, and we say we have mature microRNA. But mature microRNA cannot target messenger RNA by itself. It binds to some proteins. So let's label them. So these, pro these structures right here, these are proteins. And we have a general name for all these proteins. They're called risk proteins. So now we have this microRNA risk complex. And it can bind to the messenger RNA. And you can see the two things happening here. Here's a translational control. We can see that this is the ribosome. And when it gets here, it's going to be blocked. So we are stopping translation with microRNAs. Here we're showing you that we have this risk microRNA complex bound. And it is targeting that mRNA molecule to be degraded by enzymes. So we're not even going to be able to start translation on this mRNA molecule. Here's just another diagram showing you how microRNAs are processed and how they can block gene expression. This is the diagram I want to use to show you why the microRNAs will fold up into this hairpin structure. Remember, messenger RNAs are single-stranded nucleotides, and so are the microRNAs. But you can get bases that are complementary to one another, and so they'll fold up into these hairpin structures. So let's say we're making single-stranded microRNAs, and an A gets placed here, and a U gets placed further upstream on that microRNA. Then they can actually form a bond, a hydrogen bond there. And so we could have maybe a G here, and it's bound to a C. So they'll fold up into these hairpin structures. So again, to summarize what we just talked about, here comes dicer, dicer dices, and we have these fragments of microRNAs. We know that these proteins are called the risk proteins. They'll bind to the microRNAs. I have a mature complex now that can target the mRNA for degradation that we see here. So here's one thing that can happen to stop gene expression, or it can block translation. So that's a translational control there. That fifth way that we can regulate gene expression is through post 
transcriptional control mechanisms. And you might remember this diagram. We talked about how cyclins are produced at different times during the cell cycle. And they combine the cyclin-dependent kinases that we have here. And then this can lead to activation of molecules related to a certain stage of the cell cycle and cell division. Whenever a cell receives a signal that it needs to progress through a stage of the cell cycle, then we know that those genes related to cyclin B are expressed, and cyclin is then being produced. At the same time, other genes are going to be expressed that are going to code for enzymes that will destroy the cyclin. So one way that we can control whether a protein is in the cell is that we produce these enzymes that can degrade these proteins. As long as those proteins are in the cell, then they're going to be doing a certain job. And sometimes we do not want these proteins present and active. So we have to have a way to destroy the protein and basically silence the gene. So this diagram shows you exactly how proteins can be targeted for destruction after they're made. I want to mention this molecule. Proteins that need to be degraded are tagged by ubiquitin. And that targets them to be degraded by an enzyme. So we can see in this diagram there's a protein to be degraded. Ubiquitin attaches and we have a proteasome that comes along which will encase that protein and it can target for and it can target it for destruction like we see here. This diagram is showing you what level of gene control we're at. So we talked about we can have changes in the DNA structures that would affect gene expression. We can alter transcription factors that would affect transcription. The RNA can be processed differently with alternative splicing and changes to the length of the tail of the mRNA molecule. We can target mRNA to be degraded by those microRNAs. We can stop translation with microRNAs as well. And finally, we have controls related to the degradation of proteins. You might think it's odd that I'm talking about viruses now because we just got done talking about eukaryotic gene expression. And viruses have nothing to do with that. But remember I said before we talk about regulating gene expression, if you understood protein synthesis and transcription and translation, then those concepts were going to be easy for you to understand. The same thing goes with viruses. If you understand protein synthesis and transcription and translation, then you're going to understand how viruses are able to use cells to reproduce. Now what viruses do is they gain entry into host cells. And they use the enzymes, the molecules, the ribosomes of the host cell to create a copy of the virus DNA or RNA and also to make all the proteins needed to build the virus. What I think is interesting is viruses themselves are not considered alive. And here's the reason why. In order to be considered alive, there are different characteristics that you have to meet. So for example, all living things consume food, they make waste, they have to be able to reproduce, they grow, they're all made of cells. And viruses do not have those characteristics. They do not eat, they do not make waste, they cannot reproduce on their own. They have to use a cell to reproduce, make new viruses. They do not grow once they're assembled, and they are definitely not made of cells. A big idea you need to understand about viruses, because someday we want some of you to maybe go into virus research, because viruses are really hard to beat. We want you to understand that viruses are so hard to beat because they reproduce very efficiently. So they reproduce rapidly, and they have high rates of mutations. These mutations give them new variations, and so they have rapid evolution. Because they evolve so quickly, it's hard for us to stop them. So a medicine that was killing them in an organism at one time will someday no longer be effective because they mutate and they develop these new characteristics and they get these new proteins allowing them to evade our medicines. Another big idea to understand is that viruses are host specific. So if your plant has a virus infection, and yes, plant cells can be infected by viruses, then you shouldn't be concerned that you're gonna catch that virus from the plant. So we say viruses are host specific. Now, when we see news reports and headlines like this, then we get a little bit nervous. 
This means that we have a virus that is mutating and it is allowing it to jump species. And if this bird flu virus can jump from birds to pigs, we're very similar to pigs, it can probably get a different mutation and then jump from birds to humans. And that was the case in 2010 with this specific type of bird flu virus that we see there. And it gained the ability to spread from birds to humans. Now the humans that were getting it were coming in direct contact with those birds. But we are one step away from a possible pandemic where millions, if not billions of people could die if this virus gains another mutation and that mutation gives it the ability to be transferred from human to human. So in this situation, humans are getting this virus, but it's not being transmitted from human to human. Something that is awful about this type of virus is you can see here that it kills 60% of the people that it infects. So imagine if it's doing that and in addition, it can be transferred from human to human, then we would have a pandemic on our hands. Now there's many types of viruses. They come in all shapes and sizes and there's no way you can know all the different structures um, of these viruses. So I'm gonna give you some general information about the structure of viruses. Viruses always contain genetic information. They're either gonna have DNA inside of them or they're gonna have RNA. They have a protein coat that wraps around and protects that genetic information. It is called a capsid. So the capsid is made of proteins. Some viruses have some enzymes. There's one that we're gonna talk about in particular. Reverse transcriptase is an enzyme and you find that in RNA viruses like HIV. And some viruses have an envelope. That envelope is a phospholipid bilayer. So this herpes virus, I can tell, has an envelope on it. This one, the polio virus, just has a capsid. It doesn't have an envelope. Um, you can see that the herpes virus also contains a capsid, and that capsid is found within the envelope. So one thing to understand about this envelope is this phospholipid bilayer came from the host cell. And I'm going to show you a diagram that depicts that here in a little bit. Something else that viruses are going to have is they're going to have receptor proteins. And you can see receptors right here. There's receptor proteins. These receptor proteins will fit receptor proteins on the host cells. And that is what's going to trick those cells to take in the genetic information of that virus and become virus producing factories. Like I mentioned, there's lots of different viruses out there, but there is a type of virus that you need to know well, and that is a retrovirus. A retrovirus is a virus that contains RNA, not DNA. An example of a retrovirus, a well-studied retrovirus, is HIV. HIV is a virus that infects T cells of the host, and T cells are white blood cells that help you fight infection. So this virus is going to take out the cells that are supposed to be protecting you from bacteria and other viruses. So let's go back to the name retrovirus. Retro means backwards. So all other organisms on Earth contain DNA as their genetic information, but retroviruses are backwards. They contain RNA. Because they contain RNA as their genetic information, they have to have also an enzyme that is called reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase is going to do as the name suggests. It's going to do the reverse of transcription. Remember, transcription was taking DNA and converting it into an RNA sequence. Well, the opposite is going to happen with reverse transcriptase. It's going to take RNA and it's going to use it to build DNA. So now let's look at how a retrovirus like, like HIV can infect a cell. So here I have a host cell and I can see it's being infected by an HIV retrovirus. It can gain entry to the host cell because that host cell has receptor proteins that this virus can bind to. And when the virus binds to the receptor proteins, then that cell is tricked to take in that virus by endocytosis. 
And once the genetic information makes it into the host cell, then we can see reverse transcriptase is getting busy here. It's going to take that viral RNA and convert it into DNA. So this DNA that you see here is actually viral DNA. It's going to code for proteins related to the virus. From there, you can see that this double-stranded DNA, virus DNA, is now inserted into the host cell's DNA. So from this point on, this cell is going to get busy reproducing viruses. So here's what's going to happen. We can see that transcription is taking place. So again, those viral genes are going to be transcribed. And we're going to make mRNA, which will code for virus proteins. And we're also making new RNA for those new viruses. Because here's a new virus, and you can see that it has RNA in it. So transcription is going to lead to this RNA that's getting packaged up into these new viruses. That mRNA that comes from those viral genes is going to be translated and we can see that taking place right here, and we're getting virus proteins. So let's indicate that. These are virus proteins. And you can see that the blue ones are representing those proteins that are going to come together. They're going to make the capsid. Remember, the capsid is, I'm going to label it for you, is this part right here that encloses the genetic information. And it's making receptor proteins so that it can infect other cells. And then some of those proteins are reverse transcriptase. So we probably should label that right here. You can see that. I'm going to point to the green dots here. And we've got them now packaged up into these new viruses. So they're making more of these enzymes. Reverse transcriptase to include in each of these new viruses so they can infect other cells and reproduce. Since we're focusing on RNA viruses, I want you to understand that RNA viruses are the most difficult ones to deal with because RNA viruses, they mutate more often than DNA viruses. This graph is showing you the mutation rate for different organisms. And you can see the mutation rate for RNA viruses is the highest, more so than viruses that just have single-strand DNA and for viruses that have double-stranded DNA. And it even has our mutation rates of different eukaryotes. Remember we said that when DNA is replicated, we have proofreading enzymes that can fix errors in the DNA sequence. But when the RNA is produced to be packaged up into these new viruses, there are no proofreading enzymes. So we get lots of mistakes in the base sequence, which are mutations. So that's why it's trickier for us to come up with medications and vaccines that target these RNA viruses. It's because they mutate so often.